Well, it's been quite a while since the previous episode in the Egg and Ballistics 101 series. And I know the long wait sucks, but I think that the wait just may have been a blessing in disguise because the experiences and the opportunities I've had to learn so much more about these topics over the past year or so have been extremely valuable to me. And I'm really looking, to, looking forward to sharing this knowledge with you. And this is going to be an important episode because unfortunately, I think that a lot of us just blindly put our trust in manufacturers and we think that they know what they're doing all the time. But the truth is that a lot of them don't know what they're doing all the time. I think there's a bit of a disconnect between the manufacturers and the components that they outsource, as in the barrels in this case, um, where the manufacturer has one vision for the gun. The barrel manufacturer has another vision for what he wants his barrel to do and when the two come together there's a bit of a disconnect and it doesn't actually work out the way it's supposed to. Hopefully this episode will help you to understand a little bit more about what's going on kind of behind the scenes the more technical stuff so you can figure it all out for yourself and make informed decisions on what the best gun is for you. So let's get straight to it. Let's dig into this topic and let's learn stuff. So we're now on to the external ballistic section of the series. And today's topic is projectile stabilization. Up until now, we have discussed internal ballistics, which is how the guns work and what's going on inside the barrel. But we've now moved on from that and we're focusing on what happens to the projectile in flight. I will mention that we did deal with some external ballistics in part six. The episode was called Barrels and Twist Rates. And these two episodes do supplement each other very, very well. So I would suggest that you check that one out before watching this one. In that episode, I discuss rifled barrels and I talk about their role in inducing spin on the pellet or slug. I also briefly discuss the difference between bullets and pellets and why they require different barrels, but I'll recap quickly. In a nutshell, pellets have their center of pressure behind their center of mass, and so they are self-stabilizing in a sense. If you think about it, momentum will pull the center of mass forward and drag from oncoming airflow will pull the skirt back. The design of a Diablo pellet is inherently stable and doesn't need any form of spin stabilization to actually keep the nose facing forward. I don't know how many of you have played badminton before, but a Diablo pellet and a shuttlecock actually behave very, very similarly in flight. A shuttlecock, even if it is launched backwards, will actually eventually right itself and its nose will follow its trajectory all the way. And this is without any need for spin stabilization. And the same applies to those funny little nerf dart ball things that people throw. They can be wobbly a bit, you know, a bit wobbly when you first throw them, but they'll eventually come right and their nose will follow the trajectory perfectly. Now, when I first came up with the idea for the series about two years ago, I wasn't planning to talk about slugs at all because at that time, there wasn't much around when it comes to air guns and slugs. They didn't really go together. But we've really seen a shift over the past year or so where air gun manufacturers are starting to take slugs more seriously. And, you know, the whole industry is kind of shifting towards high BC projectiles. So I think it's something we do need to discuss. Now, slugs are completely different to pellets in that they have their center of pressure in front of their center of mass. Shot through a smooth barrel, they would begin to tumble pretty much hopelessly through the air and it would be a complete waste of time. So how do we fix this? Well, we turn the slug into a gyroscope. We induce a spin, which basically prevents that overturning torque, which wants to flip the slug around from having any effect. It's kind of like a spinning top. A spinning top that isn't spinning will want to fall over because the center of mass creates an overturning torque. But if it's spinning fast enough, it'll remain the right way up, even though those other forces still exist. It makes a lot of sense to all of us that bullets and slugs require spin stabilization. But what about Diablo pellets? It doesn't really make sense because if they are self-stabilizing, then they should be able to, you know, go on their merry way and we don't have to worry about inducing any kind of spin on them. But that's not the case. And the reason for this is that as the pellet leaves the barrel of the gun, you actually have air behind the pellet that is moving faster than the pellet itself that's coming from the back of the skirt and that actually wants to flip the pellet around. So what you need to do is induce some kind of spin to keep that axis rigid and stop it from flipping over and that's why we have barrels with rifling on them to keep the pellet flying straight. It's kind of like a shuttlecock. When you first hit the shuttlecock it you know it flies backwards for a while and it, it has to you know, right itself as it faces that on oncoming airflow. It's the same with Diablo pellets. They only really stabilize a, a little bit away from the muzzle when they've got enough air coming towards them to work the magic around the, the head and the, the skirt and 
force it to go the right way. But at the muzzle, none of them are flying completely straight. By imparting a spin on the pellet, we enable it to overcome those forces at the muzzle and fly straight. And this is why 10 meter and 25 meter competition guns tend to have barrels with very fast twist rates, like one in 16 or one in 18. Those pellets remain dead straight out the muzzle and perform very well at close range. But here's where the danger comes in. A question that not many people ask is, is it possible to overstabilize a projectile? And the answer to that is absolutely. And I think that this is probably one of the biggest stuff ups in our industry right now. Let me explain. Many people wrongly assume that the main purpose of spinning a pellet is to stop it from tumbling. But as we've already discussed, the shape of a pellet in itself is enough to prevent that from happening. People use twist rate calculators and formulas designed for spitzer bullets to choose a twist rate for their pellet barrels. And they're completely missing the point. The reason we impose a spin is to average out errors in the balance or shape of the pellet, not to stop it from tumbling. And this is why we need to look at pellet barrels and slug barrels as two completely different things. We all know that even the best pellets and slugs out there have small defects. These can be imbalances in the weight or imperfections in the shape or even just damage to the skirt. If an imperfection shifts the center of gravity or the center of pressure off the axis of symmetry, the pellet or slug can veer off course a little bit. By imparting a little bit of spin, we cause that force to actually move and point in all directions along the pellet's travel instead of just in one direction, which is what gives us that wobble that we sometimes see. The wobble is not ideal, but it's better than having that pellet drift completely off target. I suppose it's the same reason that we see arrow fletchings have a little bit of a twist to them. The arrow doesn't need to be stabilized, but the slight spin averages out the aerodynamic imperfections. And this is more of a transitional ballistics thing, but sometimes the pellet or slug looks perfect on the outside, but the lead has cavities in it, offsetting the center of gravity and causing it to rotate around the bore axis in a helical shape. This can cause the pellet or slug to actually fly in an unwanted direction as it leaves the barrel. And no amount of spin is going to correct this. In fact, the faster the spin, the greater that offset center of gravity is going to want to be thrown out as it leaves the barrel. And I believe that this is one of the reasons that we see more flyers from barrels with faster twist rates. How do we fix this? Well, we can do our best to find well-made pellets and slugs, but even then, there are bound to be small imperfections. I have noticed that bore rider designs like Lothar Walther barrels, which have very deep grooves, tend to be very susceptible to this problem because the pellet head or the bearing surface of the slug often never touches the grooves. I believe that one of the reasons we see so few flyers from Smooth Twist and Smooth Twist X barrels is the fact that their barrel design reshapes the pellet or slug by coming in contact from all sides across the entire bearing surface so that by the time the pellet or slug reaches the choke and the crown, they are all exactly the same size. So no pellet sorting required in terms of head diameter and you can even get away with a slightly damaged skirt sometimes. A rigid axis is fantastic at the muzzle because it prevents the projectile from wobbling as those gases come behind it. But what happens when it's further down range? Well, as we know, it has a bit of a trajectory where it starts to go down. And when it does that, it actually needs to change angle because the angle of departure from the barrel is different to the angle of flight. And if it can't adapt to this, we say that it loses its tractability. And this can cause all kinds of very, very serious problems. We'll discuss in detail exactly what happens when a projectile loses its tractability in another episode. But basically the end result is that you'll see things like the BC drop, you'll see a lot of spin drift, and your point of impact might shift. With a pellet, the result of overstabilization can be even worse than with a slug. You know those crazy spirals you see at long range with pellets sometimes? That can be caused from overstabilization. When that pellet loses its tractability, what happens sometimes is something called uh, gyroscopic precession and nutation, which is when you see your pellet doing this, like a smaller spiral within a bigger spiral, and it just kind of gets out of more and more out of control until you've lost everything. That's something that happens more with pellets and with slugs, and it's directly linked to the loss of tractabil tractability and overstabilization together. It's just a really bad combination. Unfortunately, the lack of understanding of how these things work is one of the things that is plaguing our industry right now. Um, just because you know, you've got tight groups at 25 or even 50 meters doesn't mean that you've got the perfect twist rate. What a lot of manufacturers don't understand 
is that the spin rate of the projectile actually changes between the muzzle and further downrange. And I'm talking about the spin rate with respect to the, the distance that the pit is traveling. So the ratio between forward movement and spin rate. A 1 in 20 twist barrel will cause the pellet or the slug to rotate one full revolution in the first 20 inches of its travel, but that's at the muzzle. And what happens is that the, the rate of deceleration, the rate at which the pellet slows down, is actually faster than the rate at which the rotation slows down. And so that ratio changes, and so when the pellet or slug is 75 meters downrange, the spin rate of the pellet, while at the muzzle it might have been 1 in 20, but downrange it might be 1 in 10. So that's where things start to fall apart. One of the things I've really learned to like about FX is that they know exactly what they're doing when it comes to barrels. They know what they need to do to get specific results and they understand these things. So a barrel made for a hundred yard bench rest, for example, they will make that barrel knowing what twist rate they have to have to have optimum performance at that distance. And same with 25 meters. If they wanted to build a rifle for 25 meter bench rest, they would know what twist rate they need to put in there to get optimum performance at that distance. And at the moment, there aren't really any other barrel manufacturers that are doing this. Although FX do have the ability to kind of make specific barrels for specific distances, they have kind of focused on the long range stuff. Um, I think simply because you don't really need extremely tight performance at close ranges for most hunting and sporting applications. It's at long range where it really matters. So they've tend to focus on that. So the standard FX barrels have pretty slow twists that are you know, suited for long range shooting. A lot of people do only take note of the minimum twist rate required to stabilize something, but not many people look at the maximum twist rate. You know, the point at which that axis becomes too rigid for good performance at long range. And this is actually a big problem. The more people you speak to in the industry, the more you realize how important this, this parameter is, that you, you don't exceed the maximum twist rate. Um, you know, you talk to people in the industry who've been making slugs and pellets for decades and you've done all the tests, they'll actually tell you that it's better to err on the slow side where you're just able to just stabilize a projectile then to err on the fast side where it's like safely stabilized because if you're too safe and you're seeing good results at, at close range sometimes things fall apart at long range so it's interesting to note that sometimes it's better to err on the slow side than the fast side and that's where a lot of people are getting it wrong so what are the strengths and weaknesses of you know shooting pellets versus shooting slugs well, we're going to ignore ballistic coefficient for this comparison because we know for a fact that slugs have much better BCs than pellets. That's why you're not allowed to use slugs in a lot of these competitions. They would just dominate. Um, but, you know, BC aside, I'd say that the strength of pellets, or one of the biggest strengths, is just that they are so, so, so precise. If you use the right twist rate and emphasis on the right twist rate, those pellets will generally stay very, very straight because of the fact that the oncoming airflow actually enhances their performance. So that's one of the big strengths of pellets. The weakness of pellets, however, is that because of their shape, they do encounter some weird turbulence around the waist and the skirt, especially at high speeds. And this is what causes that crazy spiral that we'll look at in the next episode. Unfortunately though, a faster twist rate can actually make this worse. Slugs are way better in this area actually. They are able to handle much higher velocities without losing their stability. And this is something that I've learned to love so much over the past while. I've almost exclusively started shooting slugs now. I just don't understand why with the, te the technology we have, where we're able to shoot things at much higher velocities, that we limit ourselves with the design of the projectile. It just seems silly to me to limit yourself to 900 feet per second or 850 feet per second when your gun's capable of doing much better. Build a projectile around the gun. That's just my personal opinion, but I think that's the future. If slugs do have a weakness from an external ballistics point of view, it's probably the fact that if they do not leave the muzzle perfectly straight, they don't correct themselves as easily as pellets do. It is possible for slugs to actually correct themselves in flight. Uh, you know, if they stabilized correctly, they will do this. And if they made well with good balance, they will do this. But generally speaking, Pellets are way more forgiving in this area where if you're a little bit off in your velocity or in your, um, you know, if you're not shooting out of such a great barrel, the pellets will make the most of their dire situation and actually fly straight. Whereas a slug, if it's not shot out of a good barrel, will go a little bit more skew and you won't get the same precision. The slug liners in my FX air guns are very, very good. And the result of that is that if I have 
really well-made slugs that are well designed i'm pretty much matching the precision of my pellet barrels and at longer ranges completely out shooting pellets so there is a, a catch to that you do have to have very well-made components slugs aren't as easily available as high quality jsbs but if you can get hold of good slugs and good barrels then you are pretty much sorted and that pretty much sums up this episode i hope you learned something today i know i learned a heck of a lot while having to research this topic and, and do my own testing um, and i'll see you in the next episode which is going to be the episode where we discuss gyroscopic precession and mutation which in layman's terms is when you see those pellets doing this through the air we're going to talk about what causes that and we're going to talk about why it's important not to shoot your pellets too fast so thanks for watching guys and i'll see you in the next episode